Okay, so um, Chuck showed a lot of plots uh, where he has clustered the data from Hufa. And uh, so the first thing is uh, um, to understand what the objective is. So essentially here you're trying, I mean cluster analysis is a very hard problem because, you know, it's difficult to write down uh, a clean mathematical formula and then solve it. Like principal component analysis, you know, has much cleaner um, way of sort of coming up with a solution. And essentially what you're trying to do is assign related objects, whether you're looking at the compounds or the subjects or even the experimental conditions, to homogeneous groups. And that's where all the different algorithms that are available, for example, metabo analysts are trying to do. So essentially what you, so, so you see what the difference uh, with PCA is. PCA, if by chance, you know, along those directions of maximum variability that we talked about, you see a nice clustering structure, the technique is going to sort of capture it. But it's very easy to construct counterexamples where there is very nice clustering structure, but it's not aligned with the directions of maximum variability. That's why PCA, for, in that sense, can be a hit and miss uh, from a clustering analysis perspective. That's why there are much better techniques, and as I say, there are it has a very long history. There are dozens of algorithms. Um, usually the ones that you see implemented um, in the type of analyst or similar packages is based on this linkage analysis because it's very nice to visualize um, the results. And essentially all of them are based on the notion of distance between um, your objects or on the notion of similarity. Um, so one thing when, for example, um, you do cluster analysis of your metabolomics data, you need to make sure that, roughly speaking, um, all the metabolites have been expressed on the roughly the same scale. So that's why normalizing the data or putting them on a log scale is important. Because, other, you know, in most cases, in terms of when you do no, uh, cluster analysis, you're going to calculate the distance between one sample and another sample. But this distance is affected by scale. So let's say that we have two metabolites, and one metabolite is measured in millions, you know, and that's what the data that you get, and in the other is measured in thousands. So you can easily see that when you calculate the distance between these two samples, essentially the distance that you're calculating in that case is completely dominated by the metabolite that is measured in millions, because that's where you have the largest distances. So my point is that if you don't take care of this little technical issue, you may be looking at cluster analysis results, but essentially are dominated by a few metabolites that are measured on the largest scales. So that's why, you know, putting the data on the same scale through a log two transformation or a z-score transformation, all these transformations that are available in metabo analyst that you're gonna um, go through tomorrow is important. So, something to keep in mind. Um, lots of uh, algorithms. In metabo analyst, all these are uh, implemented, and also variations of k-means and variances, and its variants. If you go to R, you can do much, much more fancy stuff. In some cases, it may be needed to go to more fancy stuff. In most cases, uh, not really, I mean, these are still very good and robust algorithms. Um, so here, uh, what I'm showing you is, um, you know, how you can again combine differential analysis with cluster analysis. So here we're using all the compounds, and, and essentially, you know, what we see is that potentially there is a nice clustering structure in terms of the samples. These were cell line samples from two different conditions. And to a large extent, you see that the C class clusters nicely together, although there are a couple of outliers, and the F, and this is a huge outlier, because all this is, in principle, you should have expected them to cluster together. Um, this is a little bit disconcerting, and they're similar with the Fs. So essentially, what this tells you is that you have a good group of um, cell line data that are very homogeneous, and that's why they have similar patterns, another group of data from the other condition that are also fairly homogeneous, but you have also outliers. 
So this is another way where you can use these global techniques to start detecting global patterns. So PCA looks at maximum directions of maximum variability. Here you're trying sort of to arrange your data in the most homogeneous manner. And as you can see, in this particular case, before creating this heat map, we clustered separately both the samples and the metabolites, and therefore you start seeing nicer patterns. Um, on the other hand, here, again, um, C7 shows up on the wrong place because what I did here was essentially I extracted only differential compounds. So I used the results from differential analysis. And essentially, you see a much more homogeneous pattern between the Cs and a much more homogeneous pattern between the Fs. And C7 sticks like a sore thumb, which tells me I have an outlier, whether it was bad data or whatever, probably for any downstream analysis or for any interpretation, I need to get rid of C7. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, these were two different uh, cancer cell lines. So, so, so the fact that uh, you know one of them from one of the groups clusters with the Fs, especially even after I look at the most important differential compounds, that probably suggests that uh, that was a bad replicate. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. No, no, in this case, you know, I first do this analysis, and right now, um, you know, I spot this pattern based on the results, and then that's sort of another way of, you know, uh, from a quality control perspective, you detect something and then you go back and start going through the questions that you just raised. But for example, with um, you know, let's say human subjects, um, you know that may point out either to a technical issue or to some, as I was saying, outliers in many cases um, encapsulate some very interesting biological going on. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so here is a cluster analysis for the SWAN study. And here I'm showing all groups. And this is not very surprising because having gone through different type of analysis, you know, this is another uh, confirmation that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the data uh, because neither principal component analysis gave you nice patterns. They were not very strong differentials. So this is another way of essentially reinforcing your insights about what is going on with this particular data set. So even here, after I do, you know, I combine it with the differentially expressed that we looked at yesterday, um, you know, I don't see a clean structure of the yellows, the blues, and the um, black samples, you know, according to this coloring scheme. And that says that, again, there is still a lot of heterogeneity. So that's where, remember, this is sort of um, we, what I haven't done here. This is just for illustration purposes for uh, this workshop. What this tells me is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the data. However, you may have covariates. You know, the subjects may have different age, you know, different weights, different um, clinical conditions and so forth beyond this classification that we know. 
So that's where we discussed yesterday that you may have, when, for example, when you do differential analysis, to bring all these covariates to correct for that heterogeneity. Here, I haven't done any of this, just to illustrate how cluster analysis works and or what you look for when you do cluster analysis. But especially in epidemiological studies, you need sort of to bring into your modeling, even when you do differential analysis, um, potentially all these covariates to correct for heterogeneity. So just running simple t-tests um, on your metabolites probably is not adequate, especially if you suspect that there is a lot of heterogeneity in your underlying subjects. Yeah. So that's something that came up. And I think this is exactly what goes on. I mean, we're still analyzing the data and you know, improving the features. But I suspect this is sort of an, um, the issue and how it demonstrates on these type of plots. So uh, I think I've already mentioned this point, but I would like to emphasize it. On occasionally, if you run principal component analysis, you may find, because it's so nice to visualize the data using principal component analysis, you may find um, a nice structuring, a nice structure of the data, and you may see nice groups. However, principal component analysis is primarily a way to summarize all this high dimensional data, uh, and it's not designed to find groups. There are much better techniques. Um, and of course, in both type of analysis, whose objectives are slightly different, uh, filtering metabolites through differential analysis, if you have those groups a priori as part of your um, study design, is important because essentially you start reducing the data and then you start seeing what happens in terms of more global patterns. And both techniques can be used in different ways of identifying these multivariate outliers. And then, of course, as we just had this discussion, you go back and try to figure out whether this is biologically interesting or there was a technical problem. And then you need to decide whether to give those samples or exclude them from any uh, downstream analysis. <clears throat> OK. Um, Yesterday, uh, Farsad spent a lot of time um, in his presentation in the afternoon talking about classification models and trying to create a biomarker panel. So then we get into predictive modeling. And I'm going to focus primarily on classification models. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to go back and reuse Farsad's samples, uh, slides, you know, within the context of this type of techniques. Um, <clears throat> if your outcome is, for example, a continuous variable, so the outcome is not sort of whether you can identify two groups or put new samples in two groups, so your outcome is not categorical, but a continuous type of outcome like uh, survival times, non-recurrence, exposure to some environmental factor, then we're talking about regression models. Unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to go uh, through that. Regression models are very powerful, and uh, but especially they are related when sort of you are trying sort of to uh, identify a biomarker panel and correlate it with particular clinical outcomes. We're going to focus much more where we're trying to come up with a biomarker panel for distinguishing between groups. So our outcome is a categorical variable. Either you are diabetic or you are a healthy subject, or diabetic, metabolic syndrome, or healthy subject. <clears throat> so um, so again, so this is sort of a special case of a categorical outcome variable. Um, and there are some conceptual differences when you try to build such models compared to standard regression models. So there is a huge literature. These are called classification models. And it's a good chunk of the machine learning literature. And there are a lot of recent developments, um, what we call sparse modeling, exactly because of omics data. You know, so essentially, you know, you're trying sort of to come up with a biomarker panel. And the problem is that you have 100 samples and you have 800 features. And therefore, at that point, 
you would like your technique sort of to select just automatically a subject of the features and create the biomarker panel. So there are technical issues and there are some nice new developments. Uh, some highly successful techniques for classification is logistic regression. That's where Farsad used it, uh, where he put in such a model those that were differentially expressed with appropriate FDR co uh, control. He mentioned something about random forest. He mentioned something about partially squares discriminant analysis. Another powerful class is support vector machines. A lot of these, primarily logistic regression, random forest, partially squares DA, are implementing a lot of packages. I think you are going to see a demonstration of these two techniques because they are in Metabo analyst. But um, all of them are very, very powerful in their own ways. And, you know, on average, none of them exhibit strong um, significant differences in performance compared to the other techniques. These are some of the most powerful methods out there, you know. So, you know, there are some other methods you may have heard of, like linear discriminant analysis that are much older, you know, they date back into the 30s, and they may not be as powerful as some of these in terms of performance. Um, so, essentially, one key aspect when you build, um, so how is this different than um, differential analysis? In differential analysis, essentially, you're doing all these tests that we discussed through T-tests or ANOVA models and stuff like that, and you're trying to see which were the most differentially significant metabolites. And of course, you can use those and put them as Farsad did in one of these models. But the purpose of these models is to identify a biomarker panel, for example, that distinguishes between these three conditions in the Swan study, but the focus is on prediction. I cannot emphasize that enough. That you need to keep in mind. And that's what the motivation in Farsad study was. Essentially, based on the available data that people call also training data, you try to identify your biomed uh, biomarker panel that has good predictive ability and therefore it manages to distinguish between the three classes. But the ultimate goal, and that's what Prasad mentioned, is based on this biomarker panel, you would like to accurately predict the next patient. Because for the next patient, you haven't done the diagnosis. You only have their metabolic um, information plus maybe some other background information. So you would like to plug that information into the model that you have already created and spit out an accurate prediction. So it's not trying, so this type of model should not be used if you're really interested in understanding mechanism. This is if you're trying sort of to do exactly this, create an accurate model that for all future patients that you haven't seen, or for all future samples, depend on the nature of the study, you gather the data, and you don't want to start examining and coming up with the diagnosis, the model starts giving you as accurately as possible the diagnosis. As Farsad mentioned, of course, in a clinical context, the bar is very, very high, and you know, with his biomarker panel, he hasn't reached that bar, or he hasn't cleared that bar to be able to use it um, for clinical practice, but this is the key thing to remember. This is a prediction um, problem. Um, you know, in, so essentially what you are trying to do is, the Y is a categorical outcome, 0, 1, healthy, diabetic. F is some complicated function, and X are the metabolites or other background variables. And essentially, you're trying sort of to get the best form of F from the available data. And therefore, for future samples, you calculate only their axis. You don't know the Y, but you're trying sort of to predict it as accurately as possible. That's, that's the name of the game here. Uh, just to give you some idea of what different what different Fs do to the data. Um, so MetaboAnalyst has a number of options, including trees, random forest, which is a collection of trees, partially squares uh, discriminant analysis, 
And actually, I forgot it also offers support vector machines. So just to give you an idea, okay, how all these are different, here I'm showing you it's a very old data set. Uh, and here I'm only having two variables. This was used back in 1936 when Fisher suggested the problem of classification. And essentially, you have three classes of flowers, iris flowers. And essentially, you are trying sort of to find a model. But essentially, if you see a future observation here, you are accurately going to classify it in the O class or in the triangle class and so forth. So if you use the technique that Fisher came up in 1936, essentially, the separation, the F function, creates these linear boundaries. Then later on in the 50s, people create another F function that separates the classes by creating these quadratic boundaries. SVMs create this type of boundaries. Nearest neighbors classifiers create much more flexible boundaries. So you see here, the boundaries are parametric. Essentially, they're either straight lines or parabolas. Here, when you go to nearest neighbor classification, essentially, you are tracing a much more nonlinear type of boundary. So it's much more flexible. Um, and if you use decision trees, essentially, you are coming up with this type of boundaries. So that's why there is a whole slew of possible F functions that people have come up. And these are sort of the differences. So when you hear these names, it means of how flexible the boundary that they can create for your problem. And you can see that in this case, if the data, for example, um, you know, had a part the two classes had a particular shape, linear boundaries may not be adequate. And that's why these models fail, because they are too restrictive. Here, this may become too flexible, and you may run the problem of overfitting. And that's where you know, a number of issues come up. So the nice thing about these decision trees is that it's very easy to interpret the classification model. Because, for example, it says that if this variable for the flowers is less than 20, essentially they belong to this class. So that's something that is easy to communicate. And that's why, especially decision trees, are very popular in um, clinical decision making because it's very easy to understand exactly what the classification model is doing. On the other hand, if I show you such a complicated boundary, essentially it's impenetrable. You just believe that the model has been accurately calibrated and does a nice job, but it's very difficult to communicate exactly what is happening. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing that some of these techniques have, like the trees, are on top, for example, of interpretability, is that it also selects variables. Some of these techniques, when they come up with such a boundary, they're going to use all the metabolites in your data set. Their objective is still to build the best boundary that can give you high prediction accuracy. But some of these techniques, actually, they even select variables. So for example, Decision trees, people like them because they tell them um, explicitly which of your metabolites are most important for distinguishing between your classes. Uh, there are some technical issues of you know how big the tree is and whether you have overfitting issues, because it's always easy to overfit. And therefore, you fit the training data very well. But remember, your, absolute, your ultimate goal is when I give you a new sample to diagnose it or classify it inaccurately. So that's why you want sort of to avoid overfitting. And this is the issue of, in many cases, you need to prune the tree and therefore come up with a simpler model. So um, Chuck showed you and Farsad showed you a random forest. And this is a very, very powerful technique. Um, but it's a complicated F function. Essentially, a random forest is a collection of a lot of such trees. So how do you come up with a collection? You only have one data set. So the way you create the collection of the trees, um, and that gives rise to a forest, um, it's a complex procedure. I have all the details in the appendix if anybody cares to look at them. But essentially, the tree is constructed. You create a whole ensemble of trees. It's constructed on randomly sampled subsets of your data. Essentially, you randomly subset subjects in the SWAN data. So we have 
in total um, 250 or whatever number of samples. And therefore, if we use all the data, we can create one tree using some algorithm. Therefore, there is no other option. So what you are doing is essentially you randomly sample uh, observations from your data, and that allows you to create different trees. So you may say, okay, why at the end this works? Because every tree, when you present a new observation, votes and says, oh, based on the new data that you gave me for a new patient, I think it's a diabetic. The second tree says, I also think it's a diabetic. The third tree says, no, I think it's metabolic syndrome. And eventually, you have, eventually you reach a consensus and you classify the new sample to the majority class. Essentially, if you think intuitively what happens by doing this subsampling from the original data, essentially you're looking at small perturbations of your initial data set, and that's how you create 1,000, 10,000 trees. These days the software runs very fast. And eventually, that's how you get sort of the consensus decision because that buys you a lot of stability, and that has made the random forest such a powerful technique. So for the PUFA data, the other thing that it's a fairly complicated mechanism, the other thing that random forests give you, similar to trees, they select the most important variables. So for example, aspartic acid doesn't, is not a very important metabolite for classifying controls to NFLD patients in the PUFA study. On, on the other hand, this lipogenic index is the most important variable. Uh, I have no idea what the Burant index is, but apparently it's an important one for, and it has a lot of predictive power. So next time you see Chuck say, okay, what's your index? Um, similar for the Swan study, again, we have that these uh, three compounds are the most important ones. So that's something nice because as I showed you, these F functions create very complicated models and therefore, and for many classification or for many prediction tasks, you don't care. You may have a very complex black box, but as long as it does the job that you design it to do, you're happy. So if any of you have heard something about deep learning, which is sort of the latest and greatest these days, yes, these are very, very powerful new ways of constructing these F functions, and they're completely black boxes. You know, it's as black as a black hole. You cannot really penetrate them. The nice thing about at least random forest is that they are very powerful in terms of prediction accuracy, but they give you through a particular mechanism that we don't have time to go into, um, a glimpse of which are the most important metabolites that manage to distinguish between uh, the samples. Partially squares is another very powerful technique and essentially takes these linear combinations, but instead of trying sort of to get a weighted combination of your metabolites to identify directions of maximum variability, it takes a different weight combination, but sort of essentially tries to separate the underlying class as much as possible. So, so that's the thing. I mean, there are different techniques that use weighted combinations of your variables, but the, the weights serve different purposes. So essentially here you create weights, but give maximum separation, whereas in um, principal component analysis, you come up with weights that capture maximum variability. How do we evaluate classification models? There is confusion metrics. You have heard about sensitivity specificity. There is this issue of training and test data sets and also the business of cross-validation. So what's the confusion metrics? So this is the truth, and this is what your model spits out. In an ideal world, you would like to be, you know, Let's say that these are the diabetic and these are the health controls. You would like your model to put the health controls to predict them as health controls and the diabetic to, to um, classify them or predict them as diabetic. So essentially, an ideal confusion matrix should be fill this the diagonal entries. And if you had more classes, then the table becomes much larger. You may have 10 classes, so it's a 10 by 10 matrix. But essentially, anything that lines up on the diagonal, that's a great confusion matrix. You have a great model. If you start going on the off-diagonal entries, that means that 
the model is not that good or the data don't have such good predictive power. So based on this, um, so, okay, this is the tricky part to show you for, no, this is not the file. I have posted the file where I'm showing you the confusion matrices. Um, for the Swan data, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you the real results, but you know it has been posted, and therefore you can look at it. Um, and for the Swan study, as you expect, we have a lot of um, false classifications. Based on this table, you can also calculate the two standard measures of sensitivity. So essentially, the, the sensitivity measure is the true positives over the yellow. What is the denominator? So you're looking at the true positives over the true positives plus false negatives. So this becomes a denominator where the specificity are the true negatives over the red, the true negatives plus the false positives as the denominator. And of course, these quantities lie between zero and one. Um, another way of putting all these things together is to create these rock curves. And Farsad showed them. Essentially, I took it from his slide. So these were the row curves that he created based on cross-validated data sets. So essentially what you plot is one minus the specificity. And try now, based on the previous slide, we know how specificity is calculated and the sensitivity. Okay. So they capture different aspects of the data. And this line is essentially if any time that you see a new sample, I don't even look at the data, I just flip a coin, a fair coin, and if it's heads, I say it's diabetic. If it's tails, I say it's healthy. So essentially, this is the performance of a classifier that is as good as random guessing. So this is, of course, this is a very minimal bar that you have to clear. But for those of you that, for example, have looked at clinical studies of the PSA score for diagnosing prostate cancer, actually, you know, the PSA score is a little bit better than random guessing. Yeah, I'm correct. Thank you. So, so you know, that's why it's a very low bar as a benchmark. But you know, there are very popular diagnosis tools that do a little bit better than random guessing. Okay. So, what you want is to be the ideal classification model will be, you know, boom, you go all the way up to one, and then essentially you flatten. Essentially, this corresponds if you do the math that all your Predictions lie up on the diagonal. You have an idea. Fantastic model. That's not going to happen in practice. And the issue is for different combinations of variables or of features, and that's what Farsad's point was, you know, that by adding the lipidomic panel, essentially you have better performance, which means that essentially more samples start lining up on the diagonal. Because the ROC curve is exactly derived from this matrix. So you know, all these are intertwined. So this was, uh, so essentially he created, he looked at three classification models. The random forest that we discussed, the PLSDA that I gave you a flavor of, you know, how it looks like. And here he just ran a simply regression, a logistic regression model by just plugging in in the model the most significant differential metabolites that he identified from his data based on FTR correction. Um, oops. So here is the, another important issue, uh, especially when you create these models. So this is a little bit, you know, people do this all the time, and I do it all the time. But this is not the picture that you would like sort of to overemphasize. Because what you do here is, um, you have your data, you construct this predictive function f using different techniques, and you evaluate it. However, this overemphasizes performance. Because remember, we have used the data to construct the predictive model, and we evaluate the model on the same data set. So as long as we have a good model, it better perform fairly well. What you would really like, and that's how you would really like to assess um, 
the performance of your predictive model is on an independent cohort. That's why, you know, in many cases you get back the critiques from your R01 and they say, all this is fine, you have done a great job here, but I don't know how it's gonna do on independent data sets that may have slightly different features. Therefore, the score is not that good. Here, that's exactly what Farsad has done. He has done, he has run the models that he created here. So here you don't tinker with the F function. The F function has already been constructed based on different techniques, based on his training data, and here he just evaluates the samples. So essentially the way this is constructed is, although you know the truth, because in the test data set that you have set aside, you know who was diabetic by some expert or a healthy control, so you have the truth, but you hide it from the algorithm, and the F function just predicts. You don't do anything. You already have constructed the F function, you give the new biomarker panel that you created, and the function predicts diabetic, diabetic, control, control, and so forth. But since you have, you know the truth and you have hidden it from the algorithm, you can evaluate exactly all these measures, calculate the, con the confusion metrics, and this is what you show. If you look very, very carefully, the performance obviously goes down because, you know, the model has seen X amount of data. It has not seen millions of data points, and that's where this is something expected. But this is sort of the true performance. Because, and that's where, you know, as Farsad pointed out, his panel doesn't rise up to the clinical standards because, you know, it still does a nice job, but, you know, it doesn't clear the bar that, you know, is required. But this is the true performance of the model. Here you, you always, the results always look better for exactly that reason. You do double accounting. You use the data to construct the model and you evaluate the model on the same data. Um, the other thing that actually I wanted to emphasize, and for that didn't spend enough time on that, is he showed you this picture and he emphasized the fact that, you know, as you move to his new panel that has these variables plus the lipid biomarkers, he gets more greens in the right place and more reds. Actually, there's something much, much more interesting that's happening. Here, the standard panel that was available in the literature you know, gets, has this accuracy, so that's the first thing that you don't like. But it's not only that. Essentially, you have all these predictions that are about the 0.5, the probability of essentially here, you know, he, here he plots in terms of probability of progression. But you see, the truth here was a non-progressor, and you classify it with probability of progression 0.45. You are very close to the 0.5 line, and therefore, you know, if the data were slightly different, this person may also have jumped the boundary. So this is, it doesn't provide this panel. It's not only that it has overall accuracy 6%. So this is a nice plot that you should also look into if you can construct it, and there is software that can do that. But you also would like to see the correctly classified points, how far away from this boundary is. That's the beauty of this panel that he created, that the majority of the non-progressors, essentially you give them zero probability that are progressors according to his model. So it does much more for the majority. Yeah, the accuracy has gone up, but the accuracy could have still gone up because a lot of these just crossed the boundary and they were hovering somewhere there. Overall, your measure of performance can be 88%, but you're very still but you're still very close to a small perturbation in the data could have sent you on the other way. The nice thing with his panel is that it gives very crisp classifications for the majority of the non-progressors and fairly crisp classification for the majority of the progressors. So that's another diagnostic that you should run and not just look at the ROC curve and not just look at the confusion metrics. The confusion metrics or the ROC curves or the area under the ROC curve captures the overall performance, but here you go back and look at every sample that you have, and you see how far away from sort of the boundary is, because that gives you for the majority very clean and crisp classification. Sure. What software did you use to create that plot? <laughs> 
remember. All of these are done in R. R. Is yes. there an R package that does that? Uh, I don't remember. I, although we worked with Farsad on this, that was 18 months ago, and I don't remember. But no, essentially, you know, you 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 put them on the probability scale for one of the classes, and I think actually there is not a, a ready-made. You need sort of to program it. I think. Yeah. Is there, is there another summary calculation besides accuracy that would capture what you just said about the two distributions? No, because the accuracy is an overall summary statistic. Here, you need essentially to do this type of plot for every sample. Because here, I can look. So this bunch of samples, essentially the probability of being progressors according to the model is 0. And, this is, and the truth is that there were no progressors. Whereas you see, these samples here, yeah, we classify them as non-progressors, but you know, if one value of their metabolites in the biomarker panel changed by epsilon, they would have jumped and they would have been classified. So essentially, you have essentially you can think another way of thinking is that there are some samples in your study that are very hard to classify because they are very close. If you go back just to connect it, and this is not working. Hopefully this is working. Just to give you another review, look at this sample. It's very close. This, this class plus is very close in terms of the characteristics to the triangles. These are the very hard to classify. You know, of course, different techniques can miss them for different reasons, but there are native samples that by design, they may be very hard to classify because the two plus are not too far apart. Here, if you cannot classify this data very cleanly with whatever technique you have, then you don't, are not using the clean technique because this is a much easier problem. But here, the data, you know, the nature of the problem tells you that there are a whole bunch of samples that is a much harder task. So. But you would like also to bring your model in order to quantify exactly how hard the task is. And a bad model makes the task very, very hard. A good model improves, but there are still maybe some samples that for pure biological reasons are hard to classify. That's life. Sure. Uh, I want to know the lipids. Is, uh, you use uh, significant lipids or all the lipids? To so, Okay, so let's go back. That's an excellent question. So in this model, he used lipids that were identified by the differential analysis by doing the t-tests. This, as we discussed, the random forest has its own mechanism that identifies significant lipids, thinking about prediction. So random forest is a technique that uses um, MDA. No, no, no has a very complicated mechanism that we can talk offline that identifies um, lipids or variables that are important for classification purposes. And PLSDA has something somewhat similar to uh, the random forest. So there are something, on the other hand, for example, if you were to use support vector machines, that it doesn't have an inherently built-in variable selection mechanism. So either you need to use variables that you selected by doing the differential analysis exercise, or you just throw all the compounds. The OR is uh, calculated by logistic regulation. Yeah, so here, what Farsad did, he first identified the, the most significant differential compounds, and then he plugged them in into a logistic regression model. Okay, thank you. There is, you know, in my machine learning class, we spent about seven weeks just talking about classification. It's a very important problem. Uh, in machine learning. Okay, so the take home message of all the statistical um, aspects that we covered is uh, you know, you always need to keep an eye on st study design, and I hope I conveyed how important it is of you know, how you construct models, uh, how you construct tests, and so forth. Uh, and also, you know, what the biological question of interest is. You know, classification models, as I said, are pretty important for creating a predictive biomarker panel. If you're on, on the other hand looking for biological mechanism, um, 
the way to proceed is you go from the differentials and then you start putting those together. Um, and that brings us to pathway enrichment. I'm going to say five. Okay. Yes. Sure. Sorry, I'm going a bit too slowly. Okay. Yeah, there are five slides, so we can go through it. Quickly. 